1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. Therefore, get your minds ready for action, being self-disciplined, and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. And if you address as Father the one who judges impartially based on each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during this time of temporary residence. For you know that you are redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the times for you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. By obedience to the truth, having purified yourselves for sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower drops off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word that was preached as the gospel to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for Psalm 29. Uh, Psalm 29 that reminds us of the power of your word and the declaration and the way in which that changes the world. Father, uh, in Psalm 29 we were reminded that the word that reveals your nature shakes the whole world. Uh, brings people before you to know your significance. Father, we pray that your word will have that effect on us today. We pray that as we look at this part of 1 Peter, we'll be reminded that as temporary residents, we have a father who is the judge of the universe, who saved us at great, immeasurable cost. Father, thank you for this good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me begin with a question, point one on the outline. What does it look like to be a rejoicing mob? What does it look like to be a rejoicing mob? Now, the reason that I ask that question is because of the word that begins verse 13, therefore. Uh, Those kind of words are really easy to gloss over, to ignore, because you want to get to the really important words like purity and righteousness and holiness, don't you? And so we gloss over words like that very quickly. Words like therefore, for, but, thus. But they're really important words. They're really important words to help us understand the flow of the logic of God's word, how things tie together. You see, therefore tells me that what's about to come is based on what's come before. What's about to come is based on what comes before. This is the necessary consequence of the previous 12 verses where God has been very clear. God has been very clear in those first 12 verses. We've been told that Peter is writing a letter. Peter, one of Jesus' 12 apostles, perhaps his closest friend. God's mob are scattered throughout modern day Turkey in isolated clumps and patches. Uh, They belong to God. We're told there in verses 1 and 2 that they belong to God because of his action and his decision. They're temporary residents in the world. If you want to think of modern day culture, they have temporary resident visas and they're scattered throughout the world. It's felt sharply for them because they say they belong to Jesus, but they live under Rome. And Rome isn't the most comfortable of political environments. In fact, it means that they are on the margins of society, on the outside of their towns, and that's always been the way for God's people. 
Uh, we've been told very clearly that as a group who are temporary residents in the world, caught between the poles of this is what the world says and this is who we belong to, Peter wants them to do one thing. Do you remember that from last week? Verses 6 and 8, what was it? Rejoice. 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 To be deeply contented, satisfied, even happy because you have deep roots that give you great joy. And then he gave us those six reasons. Remember them from last week? Six reasons to rejoice because God has given you great mercy because that great mercy through the definite resurrection of Jesus Christ has given you brand new life with an immovable future where God is your father. That gives you a great understanding of where you are in the world at the moment, an understanding of reality. It shows how trustworthy Jesus is. It redirects your affection to Jesus and you live in a privileged moment of history. Six reasons to rejoice. Therefore, what we're about to look at today is the necessary consequence of what we were told last week. This is what it looks like to be a rejoicing mob. What we're about to look at today is the necessary consequence of that command. God wants us to know what it looks like to be rejoicing. Now, before we get into that, uh, let me just make two observations that will kind of hopefully guard us from going too far off to either side. Uh, The first is this. The therefore is only possible because God has given us his great mercy. God has showered us with an abundant, an abundant kindness that just overflows. If we don't keep that in mind, what we're about to get is really just an Anthony Robbins speech. Self-improvement, make yourself better. We've got to keep God's great mercy there in the background as the foundation. And the other thing to remember is that every you in this passage is plural. And my tendency is to individualise God's word. This is all about me. No, this is about the mob. It's about the mob, which is made up of a bunch of individuals looking like this, but everything here is plural. This is the existence of a mob, a mob of temporary residents in the world who belong to Jesus. And the therefore is made clear, you'll see there on your outline, at points two, three, four, and five, uh, four commands. Set your hope completely, verse 13. Be holy, verse 15. Conduct yourselves in reverence, verse 17. Love one another. The first command, I'm at point two on the outline, is there in verse 13. Therefore, get your minds ready for action, being self-disciplined, and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God's mob are to have their hope completely set on a future event. On a future event when Jesus Christ will appear as he truly is, and when God's grace will be revealed. God's mob are future focused. There is a definite moment coming in history. And that moment is when Jesus Christ will return and we'll see him as he truly is. The Lord, the ruler, the judge of the whole universe. And at that moment, God's grace will be revealed. Uh, God's mob are completely set on that day because on that day it will be revealed that God's abundant mercy, his grace, was enough. You didn't need to add to it. You didn't need to subtract from it. We're looking forward to that day because on that day when Jesus comes back, we'll see that God's abundant grace and mercy was enough to make a mob like this, so diverse, so different, be able to stick together until that day. God's mob are single-mindedly focused on that day. And you can't understand that day unless you understand the first time grace and Jesus appeared together. And that was when Jesus came to live, die and rise for people like us. The only reason God's mob can look forward to that day is because of that moment back there. And the fact that the grave is empty and that Jesus is alive. This is rejoicing because it says publicly, that's our hope. That's enough. 
We look forward to that day because what Jesus did back then was sufficient. It's a complete hope. Did you notice that? Set your hope completely, not 95%, not 90%, not hedging your bets and kind of managing your risks. It's a complete hope, all-encompassing, all-reaching. It says publicly, we delight in that day. How's that possible? Where we're told how it's possible to express it in verse 13. Did you see that there? We're told two ways. Get your minds ready for action, being self-disciplined. Literally, it means this. Gird the loins of your mind and be sober. It's the, it's the language of war. A, a soldier's going into battle, a, a Roman soldier. People would have been familiar with this, and they wear, wore a robe. And once they'd suited up, they then got their robe and tied it up around their waist and knotted it with a belt so they were ready for action. They could run. They could sprint. They could fight. And when they did that, they got their minds ready because I think when you go into war, I've never had the experience, I think when you go into war, your mind's got to be ready, doesn't it? And that's the language for God's mob. Get your minds sober. Get your life organised. Because you are temporary refugees caught between two competing influences between the reality of who you are and between the reality of what the world is throwing at you. Because the world is going to either try to wear you down or seduce you, isn't it? It's going to try to wear you down or seduce you. It's going to make you tired or it's going to offer you other options. And so we need to be sharp. We need to be sober. We need to be ready to identify, resist, and focus. Now, let me just give you a, an observation. I think we are under the constant danger, if not already submitting to, I think we are under the constant danger of being anesthetized by the culture we live in, overcome. And I think it can happen to such an extent that our minds get flabby and our hopes are distracted. I think we can be tempted by the tangible, can't we? By the houses, the careers, the educations, the outcomes, the likes, the occupations, the opportunities, the holidays, the images, and the opportunities we don't want to miss. And I think when we get distracted by that, we ignore the living hope of a tomb that's empty and a king who's coming back. We ignore the reality that all of those things will pass and he never will. And when we continually marinate in that, we become soft and unable to identify or resist the things that will distract. We're not ready for war. We're no longer strangers, but we're people luxuriating in the world, aren't we? We're wallowing in false dreams. And when we wallow in those false dreams, what will happen? Our joy will be leached away because tomorrow the interest rates will go up and so will the price of bok choy and you mightn't have registered for something and so you'll miss an opportunity. But Jesus will not disappear, will he? No one's going to take him from the right hand of God and put him in a tomb. And so this anesthetization can be evident in, in, in all sorts of areas, can't it? I, I was actually thinking about it the other day. Here, here's a confession. I was thinking about it the other day when the entertainment choice I made at a moment when I could have done all sorts of other things was just to scroll through Facebook. It anesthetized me. It, it can be that simple but it can also be as complicated as through to our time choices. Do they reflect where our complete hope is. The return of our king and the grace that will be revealed. How, how can we be sober for that day? Well, I, I think the second command makes it clear. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it's written, be holy because I am holy. 
God's already been given a description in relationship to his mob. That's father. Remember that in verse 2 and 3? He's our father. As people brought into God's mob, literally adopted in, God's mob are to display the family likeness. Who do you look like? Do you look like God the Father? And what's the one character trait that this family likeness portrays? Uh, did you see it there? It was repeated a number of times, wasn't it? Holy. 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 Uh, what does holy mean? Holy means unique or singular, one of a kind. Uh, nothing else like it. Only God is holy, isn't he? But those connected to him must show that must display the family likeness. In fact, that's always been the expectation of God's people, to display God to the world. Do you remember Adam made in the image of God? Go and garden the world, Adam. That's to reflect the image of God to the world. Remember when God's mob gathered at Mount Sinai, Exodus 19, after they'd been saved out of Egypt? That's why Pat read that reading from Leviticus. What are they meant to be? They're meant to be holy. And as Dan will help us see next week, that's the same expectation of God's people now. Reflect the family likeness to the world. Why? Well, do you notice that you've changed families? Did you notice that there in verse 14? Do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, where you thought you were God and you ignored God. You've now changed families. God's mob now reflect him and his desires to the world. And we're told how to do that, aren't we? Look look there in verse 14. It's to obey God as his children. Obedience and grace aren't enemies. Grace gives rise to obedience. And secondly, that obedience expresses a change in desires. Just like our future hope is changed, so our daily desires are changed. What, What we pursue, what we aspire to, what we spend our concentration on. It's rejoicing because we're saying publicly, I'm pleased with this mob. (laughs) This family's enough. It's a great delight to be in God's mob. In fact, the way to apply this is to actually get to know your father better, isn't it? How can you reflect him to the world if you don't know him? (laughs) How can you reflect him to the world if you don't spend time with him? How can you reflect him to the world if you don't listen to him, if you don't delight in him? And that will inevitably mark God's mob as different because their desires will change. Now let me also point out two dangers here, two dangers. I I think the first danger is to be worn down by the world around us. It's to go, it actually is just really hard. It's just so exhausting reflecting God to the world. And so the danger here is to conform, to just throw your hands up in the air and just float along. That's one danger. The other danger is to be confused Uh, because often we can confuse holiness with something else, can't we? We can confuse it with something like goodness, just being good people. No, no, God doesn't want goodness. God desires godliness, which is to reflect his nature to the world, which is to reflect who our Father is, showing that we are transformed in every desire. Now, to know him as father, I'm at point four on the outline, to know him as the father actually introduces an interesting aspect of the relationship. Uh, It's there in the next command in verse 17. If you address as father the one who judges you impartially based on each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves, (coughs) excuse me, in reverence during this time of temporary residence. You see, the danger with calling God Father for people like us is we get too familiar with him, isn't it? Uh, To put it crassly, it's to call him Daddy. Do you notice God's role there in verse 17? The one who will judge you impartially based on each one of your works. What does that do to your guts? Does it grab them? Does it pour some ice into your veins? 
the fact that each one of your works will be revealed to your Father who will judge you impartially. You, his mob. And so we live in reverent fear. God is our Father, but don't be familiar with him. He is awesome. He is awesome. And that will become especially clear as we consider our nature as strangers in the world. As we live in the world, we belong to God. And that means we're going to be exposed to all sorts of fears because he's our father. We're going to be exposed to the fear of rejection, the fear of marginalisation, the fear of missing out, the fear of embarrassment and shame. But which fear defines us? It's the fear of our father, isn't it? The fear that our father is the impartial judge of the universe, even of his own mob. It's sharpened even further when you go into verse 18. For, there's one of those words that helps us see the logic. For, you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the times for you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. We are strangers because God did what he redeemed us. He paid a price to set us free from what? Did you see it there in verse 18? Your empty way of life. How how is that empty way of life measured? Well, we talked about that earlier, didn't we? It's measured in things that will disappear. That's why it's empty. And you were redeemed at a great cost, weren't you? And what was the cost that redeemed you? It was the blood of a perfect man. Not just the blood of a perfect man, but the blood of the very God who is your father and will judge you, his one and only boy. That introduces something into our identity, doesn't it? It shows both our value and the cost that God was willing to pay for people like us. And and it's not just a slapdash, gee, I've got to do something to save these humans kind of plan, is it? Did you pick that up? It was a plan decided before the beginning of time. Jesus was, verse 20, destined before the foundation of the world. So God's people are that valued. At that price, at that extensive plan, this is rejoicing because we understand that as strangers we are valued and esteemed by God and know the judge of the universe as our father by a most costly way. The final command, point five on the outline, is in verse 22. By obedience to the truth, having purified yourselves for sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower drops off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached as the gospel to you. It's a really simple command, isn't it? There in in, in that verse, verse 22. Love one another. How? Uh, With a pure heart, not with ulterior motives. Love each other sincerely, not with an agenda. Love each other constantly, not when you feel like it, not when the mood takes you, or not only with those that you click with. If you want, it's another way of remembering the family tray. Remember the family tray was holy? No one loves like God. How does God love? Well, Jesus reminds us in John chapter 15 as he chats with his disciples on that last night, God loves his people at great cost in sacrifice and he then encourages his people, commands his people to love in such the same way. It reflects who we are, people who've been saved by great mercy. Such love is established on the good news revealing the very same love we experience. Such love is displayed constantly. It it commits to the love display that turns up every week when the mob gathers. 
It commits to the love display that exhorts and rebukes. Uh, It commits to the display of love that encourages. It commits to the display of love that is practical, costly kindness. And it's only understood when we understand the truth. Did you actually see that there in verse 22? By obedience to the truth. And what's the truth? Well, we're then told, aren't we? It's the good news that was proclaimed to you. That will never fade, and never disappear. You can only love like this if you know that truth and are familiar with it. Amazingly, when you know that truth, you'll actually get to know your father better, won't you? And you'll actually know what it means to display the family likeness. And this is rejoicing but because it says, this is my mob. I'm deeply satisfied with this mob. They're not deficient. They're God's mob. And I'm committed to them. I'm involved with them. I'm wholeheartedly in with them, loving them. So what what does it look like to be a rejoicing mob? I'm at the last point on the outline. It is to be a different mob in this world. It's to be people with temporary resident visas, strangers, foreigners. It's to be marked as different because, remember these commands, we hope differently, we be differently, we fear differently, and we love differently. That's who we are. And I want you to notice that this is because we live in times that we understand. Did you notice how the bookends of this passage were about eternity? Did you notice that we started with the eternal king who returned and we finished with the eternal word that won't disappear? And so we live now as a rejoicing mob, hoping differently, being differently, fearing differently, loving differently, because we know eternity. And that's our hope. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for Peter. (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, Peter's so like us. Uh, He speaks before he thinks and he takes a long time to understand the truth. Uh, Father, thank you for the display of your persistence with Peter, that wonderful image in John 21 of Jesus restoring him. Uh, Father, we're just like uh, your mob here. Uh, We're scattered throughout the world. We feel isolated and lonely. Uh, We're under pressures from the world around us, from a rule that seems to dominate and brook no opposition. But, Father, thank you that by your great mercy, you've brought us into your mob. Father, please equip us to rejoice in these four ways that we've seen. Father, equip us to hope differently, to be differently. Father, help us to fear differently. And, Father, help us to love differently. Father, we pray that as we do this, we'll be such a community here that people will come to know you as Father too and join your mob. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Ebony. (coughs) Yeah, yeah. It's a really terrific question, Ebony, and... Uh, so Ebony's question for those at home and, and here, where, where does our sin sit with all of this stuff? Is that, that the question? Uh, let me be quite open. It sits pretty much in the forefront of our minds and hearts most days, doesn't it? And that's one of the tensions that we bear. That's one of the reasons why. Remember at the start I said, keep in mind these two things. And remember I said, remember God's great mercy in the plural. We need to remember this great mercy because that has already made us God's people And so the commands that we're listening to here are getting used to what that is. So as we learn in Colossians, Colossians 3, 10 and following uh, a couple of years ago, our daily battle is to put off and put on. Get used to who you are. So does that mean that you will have no sin in daily life? No. The Bible very clearly says you will battle that daily. When you battle that daily, we're given two confidences. It's already been dealt with eternally. The verdict on the last day when Jesus comes back will be the verdict of grace. That's one of the reasons we look forward to it. You are one of my children because you trusted in Jesus and you're transformed. The other one is God has given us everything we need to battle that sin daily. So remember from Ephesians, what was the exhortation from Ephesians? You need to do what every morning? You need to suit up. 
Uh, what did we learn last week? Remind yourself of your identity. Uh, what's this? Uh, this is where you get to know the Father every day. And so, yes, you will battle sin. God knows that. Uh, God wants you to remember who you are before him and then get into the battle with all of his help. Does that make sense? Yeah, good question. Yeah, But also just, just keep remembering too, uh, one of the great things about the New Testament letters and the Old Testament is everything starts with Remember who you are. Romans 1 to 11. This is who you are. Well, 12 to 16. Let's work out what that looks like. Colossians 1 to 3. This is who you are. The rest, this Ephesians 1 to 3. This is who. So it, God is really kind because he puts in front of us how he deals with our sin before he then tells us how to behave. So we keep that balance right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. 